I am Dr. Charlie Yarish at the University of Connecticut in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Today, we are going to be having a short course uh, through ATEX Algae Culture Extension course uh, that will introduce you to the integrated multitrophic aquaculture of seaweeds, shellfish, and fish. Well, there has been a growth of aquaculture globally. And as we take a look at the growth of aquaculture, uh, along with the growth of aquaculture in the last couple of decades, have some, been some very significant issues. Along with the growth of aquaculture, which is heavily dominated by uh, animal aquaculture, there has been a steady increase in marine plant production. Roughly, if we look at the 2017 uh, reports from the FAO, which describes production in 2016, we see there's 27 million metric tons having a value of roughly around $6 billion a year. And the marine plant aquaculture or seaweed aquaculture has been growing over 8% per year since 1970. So understanding that there has been a increase in global uh, production of fin fish aquaculture and other animal aquaculture along with marine plant aquaculture gives us some very unique opportunities because when we're dealing with fin fish aquaculture, fin fish aquaculture and shrimp aquaculture are sometimes referred to as fed aquaculture. You feed fish, you feed shrimp, and the animals uh, have to release their nutrients as they process their food. As a consequence, if, if your uh, animals in your confined area are releasing nutrients, these nutrients can overload coastal waters, and these coastal waters can develop uh, problems with harmful algal blooms, or sometimes uh, what we call green tides, and these are tides uh, areas of uh, other species of algae that are opportunistic growing in the coastal waters, assimilating the nutrients, and then when they are producing, uh, they can produ be produced in such high quantities, you can see how they can cover beaches. Well, in 2008, there was a massive bloom of a green seaweed called ober or sea lettuce. It almost actually caused a postponing of the postponement of the uh, Olympics uh, in the Chinese city of Qingdao. Well, when we take a look at what fueled this bloom of the seaweeds, we have to take a look at the major sources of nutrients. Besides peoples releasing nutrients in coastal waters uh, through uh, their sewage treatment plants, uh, there was intense levels of fin fish aquaculture and shrimp aquaculture in this area of ch northern China. And you can see here this individual there being uh, covered with some of these seaweeds. Well, th those particular seaweeds that started growing or blooming there are an expression of using those nutrients that were found in these coastal waters. So we have to be cognizant that fin fish aquaculture, shrimp aquaculture have to uh, deal with nutrient release. And they've got to deal with it by trying to get a, a better feeding regimes, increasing the assimilation of the food that the animals are eating. And we have to do this to maintain the quality, environmental sustainability of our coastal waters. Well, uh, the, the technique that we use is a technique called IMTA. It's, a pro, it's an approach uh, which is leading towards a balanced ecosystem approach. What is IMTA? You combine the aquaculture of fin fish and shrimp, which are fed aquaculture, and you combine this aquaculture with extractive organisms, organisms that can use the inorganic nutrients like seaweeds or organisms that can use the organically bound nutrients 
like mollusks or shellfish. So organisms like seaweeds and shellfish and aquaculture systems are extractive organisms. They're extracting nutrients from the water. Combining it with fed aquaculture, you can develop a balanced ecosystem approach, which we call IMTA or Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture. And in this image here, you can see the shellfish to the right being mussels. It could be other shellfish like oysters. Uh, there's a picture of a nori net, which is a red seaweed. And then you can see some of the fin fish that are growing in the pens uh, in this picture in the upper left. But what I'd like to give is a little bit of a historical introduction of IMTA for New England. Because this introduction, uh, took place up in the state of Maine. It took place uh, in the state of Maine up in an area called Kapska Bay area. And it, it involved the initial cultivation of a red seaweed called pyropia or porphyra uh, being the old name of this particular species. A small little company called Coastal Plantations International was trying to grow their porphyra or pyropia in a coastal bay which didn't have any nutrients and they weren't very successful. But then uh, when we started looking around the, the uh, different bays of Maine, we noticed that the native species of pyropia were doing just great in and around farms growing uh, fin fish. And so uh, that leads us to the idea, perhaps you can transfer uh, the uh, seaweed cultivation, move it in areas in close proximity of your fin fish uh, cultivation. And indeed, uh, in uh, 1995, we did such an experiment. Now, nori, uh, the common name of this red seaweed, is very, very expressive. It lets you know when it's not happy. Happy Nori is the image to your uh, left, and Sad Nori is the image to the right. Uh, the image to the right is Nori that is not growing in an environment that has enough nutrients to support its growth. Happy Nori is growing uh, in an environment where there's a surplus of nutrients. And so this opened up this idea, let's try to do a polyculture of growing nori in an area with fin fish. So uh, if, if uh, pyropia requires all of the nutrients, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and phosphate that fish produce as waste products, why not grow them together? And indeed, we did an experiment uh, with fin fish aquaculture up in Maine uh, uh, that capitalized on the liquid waste that would principally be re being released uh, by our fin fish. And we did this experiment in Kopska Bay with a uh, small company that was trying to grow nori called Coastal Plantations International. Well, they were having a problem with their nori farm that they were trying to get off uh, and to uh, develop. They, they had very unsuccessful crops because there wasn't enough nutrients in the area where they were permitted to grow their nori. But when we took the nori nets and moved them near uh, finfish farms, and that's the finfish farms there are from salmon, uh, we noticed that the nets reddened up very rapidly. We had very, very happy nori. And we were able to figure out how many nets we would need to grow of the nori to remediate uh, a certain amount of nutrients produced by fish. So if we take a look at work that was done by Hans Ock, uh, Aquaphores uh, in Scandinavia, he estimated a release of phosphorus and nitrogen uh, per turn of fish per year. And we did some uh, rough calculations on our production that we had of our nori or pyropia. And based on that, we were able to figure out how many nets of nori uh, you would need to remediate phosphorus and how many nets of nori 
uh, that you would want to remediate for nitrogen. And this work was published in a book called Responsible Aquaculture by McVeigh and Stickney. Well, this is really uh, an important case study because it was the first open water uh, study uh, combining extractive organisms with fed organisms being finfish. And this would mitigate some of the impact of nutrients in your coastal environment. Well, when we look at this area of IMTA, I must say that IMTA, uh, the concept, uh, was a concept that was being developed in other areas of the world as well at the same time. Colleagues like Alejandro Bushman, Amir Nuyori from Israel, uh, Terry Chopin from uh, the Maritime Provinces of Canada, and Max Troll from Sweden. Uh, these are the first generation of IMTA scientists that principally worked in open water, but they also worked in land-based systems where you can combine fed aquaculture with extractive aquaculture of organisms. So what is integrated multitrophic aquaculture uh, that is relevant to where we are in New England? We could take a look at a very nice uh, characterization that was uh, produced by Dr. Thierry Chopin. And there you can see the fed aquaculture, the fin fish, principally in New England. That fin fish is going to be salmon. Uh, growing it uh, in close proximity of shellfish, such as uh, blue mussels, and then the, uh, in a curtain uh, around your uh, aquaculture of your fin fish and blue mussels, you have the uh, seaweeds such as kelp. Now, keep in mind, you're growing now uh, organisms that are doing different ecosystem services. Uh, ecosystem services for extracting nutrients. Uh, the shellfish, the mussels, are extracting organically bound nutrients from the water. The seaweeds are extracting inorganic nutrients from the water. And this will mitigate uh, the nutrients that are re being released by the fed aquaculture of salmon. Now, of course, not all nutrients uh, are going to be in the water column. Some of the, uh, some of the uh, fish will also produce uh, feces that will just fall out of the water column before they're intercepted by your shellfish or the inorganic nutrients, and they will then fall to the bottom. But on the bottom in the area where you are practicing your IMTA, you can have nets that have extractive organisms there. You can grow sea cucumbers down on the bottom beneath the pen. You can grow certain types of marine worms down on the bottom. Those organisms that are deposit feeders are, are also extracting uh, organic particles out of the water as they're falling down to the bottom and converting this into very important products that have significant markets. So when we take a look at IMTA, we've shown you some open water uh, situations that have been uh, done in New England uh, and also the Canadian Maritime provinces, but I'd like to also introduce you to IMTA that was initially done in Chile. And when we take a look at uh, IMTA, uh, we can work with open water systems. And in Chile, they have worked with open water systems growing the giant kelp or macrocystis. They also have done similar work with shellfish like mussels. They've also done work with the principal source of nutrients in their coastal waters, which, is, which are the salmon. But you can also have more controls if you're growing your fin fish on land. So in this image right here to the left, in a land-based system, you can have your fin fish uh, on the top. And by gravity, you can take the waste products from the fin fish aquaculture, pass it through shellfish, and then ultimately uh, pass the liquid waste uh, from the shellfish uh, ponds or tanks into tanks that are holding the seaweeds and this is also a land-based IMTA system. So when we take a look at our land-based IMTA system, uh, it uh, has all the important components 
you have the inflow of your uh, system, you have your fed aquaculture of your, of your fin fish, the fin fish release certain nutrients, that nutrient waste goes into your mollusk tank, your shellfish tank, and then ultimately the liquid wastes that are available uh, from the mollusk tank can go into growing your seaweed. And in this particular case there, you can see the seaweed. It's a, a seaweed called Grassleria. And this is a seaweed that it lends itself very nicely for land-based cultivation. Uh, the outflow of the water that you release back into the sea uh, it will have less nutrients in it and will then increase the sustainability of growing your land-based aquaculture in nearshore environments. So in addition, uh, when we look at our model of growing seaweeds, and indeed, like I mentioned before, uh, Professor Wushman and his colleagues in Chile, principally in the area of Chile called Portamon, where you have most of the salmon and aquaculture there, they have now developed their IMTA system that has been successful with the salmon, and this includes uh, their uh, shellfish being an oyster species, and they've also grown not only the kelp, but also they've uh, introduced another seaweed, the red seaweed, uh, called Gracilaria, because Gracilaria grows at uh, lower light levels. And so they're, what they're using in this whole system is the entire water column and maximizing the nutrients that are going into the tissue of economically important marine organisms that all have particular markets. Well, where are we today with IMTA? IMTA initially started in a very humble bay in the state of Maine in open water conditions. It migrated into uh, areas of New Brunswick, Canada, and from there it has expanded to different areas of the world. And uh, many, many different countries are practicing uh, IMTA. Some IMTA practices have been around for a very long period of time. Uh, people call those polyculture, but they were actually uh, IMTA, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture. Uh, in, uh, in this particular slide, you can see the expansion of IMTA globally uh, for different seaweeds, green seaweeds, brown seaweeds, and some of the red seaweeds. Now, uh, FAO has an excellent technical publication uh, I, on IMTA, it gives an historical introduction to IMTA, and it's really recommended that this technical publication is a must read to see the historical information on IMTA uh, and how it is practiced in, in different uh, areas of the world. Now, in addition, uh, IMTA can be used as a form of coastal zone management. Uh, it would be very uh, appropriate if you're growing fed aquaculture, is trying to integrate that fed aquaculture in marine bays with the extractive aquaculture, and this leads then to aquapark zoning. And in this particular uh, slide there, you can see how you can start doing that. Well, aquapark zoning is just an expression of IMTA making it useful. Today in, in Korea, Korea is faced with a big issue. In areas where there's seaweed cultivation, they're doing very well. In areas where there is animal aquaculture, uh, shellfish and finfish, they are separated from the, the seaweed aquaculture. And when we look at this separation, you just imagine you can get green tides, harmful algal blooms in areas where you have your fed aquaculture. So now the Koreans are working at integrating through coastal zone management plans where they are siting their fish farms with shellfish farms and seaweeds in particular bays. And this is going to be the way that we're going to have to see uh, that we will have to follow uh, 
the uh, growth of fed aquaculture in open water systems and integrate this with shellfish and seaweeds to maintain environmental sustainability. Uh, another area where we have a nice opportunity is in the planting of wind farms. Uh, if you're going to have wind farms and you're going to have boats going out to your wind farms, why not have aquaculture systems in and around the wind farms? You can have your aquaculture systems uh, like your fin fish near the wind farms and you should be able to move in your extractive organisms like your shellfish and your seaweeds and this would be improve the bottom line for uh, the operators of the farms the wind farms as well as improving the operators of the farms that are growing fin fish seaweeds and shellfish together so if you want to look at the sustainability and the economics of this, I would like to recommend a very good publication. It's by Amir Nuyori and Anna uh, Nobre. And this publication uh, is a publication that really looks at the economics of IMTA in uh, great detail. Uh, there are other publications in particular uh, that are available on more topical seaweeds there and IMTA situations and these are also available uh, through scientific searches. Uh, do keep in mind there are certain benefits for IMTA and I'd like to mention the ecosystem services because ecosystem services is a real service that IMTA can afford uh, the uh, growth of or expansion of fin fish and shellfish aquaculture. Well, in one bay uh, in northern uh, China, where there has been an intensive level of aquaculture, uh, Professor Fong has integrated the production of the seaweeds with the fin fish. And when we look at this large scale production in Sango Bay, uh, combining the kelp and scallops, combining the kelp and fin fish, this has improved the quality of the environment. This quality of the environment is really important for the fin fish. Why for the fin fish? Uh, the fin fish are then having uh, their uh, healthier, they are showing less problems with disease. Uh, and so the uh, extractive organisms can really help the cultivation of the fin fish. And Dr. Fong has looked at this, looked at IMTA systems in great detail. And in this particular figure, you can see what happens when you grow kelp and uh, scallops, what happens when you grow kelp and fin fish. Uh, together, you can see the enhanced production of that as compared to growing kelp or scallops or fin fish independently. You grow them independently, you have actually less production. So IMTA, by the very virtue of growing extractive organisms, provides a very important ecosystem service. This ecosystem service has also been uh, further developed uh, in Western Europe on the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal. There is a significant IMTA system uh, that is growing fin fish on land in com combination with growing uh, seaweeds. And the principal seaweed that they're growing is the red seaweed gracilaria and in some cases they are also growing uh, different species of nori. Now this, this increases the environmental sustainability of the fin fish. This, this basically provides also a higher quality product in the case of the seaweeds extracting the nutrients they are more robust, they have higher levels of nutrients in their tissue. You can also develop these systems that you can recirculate the water that the extractive organisms will be cleaning uh, the water up such that it can be used to uh, still uh, grow your fin fish. So these land-based systems have a very important value in what they can do because you can control the nutrients that are coming from your fin fish aquaculture by combining it with extractive organisms. 
And when we look at this finfish aquaculture, I'd like to show you this uh, operation in uh, Portugal. Uh, and this is courtesy of a company called Alga Plus there, where they work with growing the flatfish and took the effluent from the flatfish and grew the uh, grassalaria, the seaweed, in tank systems to extract uh, the nutrients from the waters before they're released back into a coastal lagoon. Now, keep in mind, you have to have lots of controls in your systems, but this is something that can be done in land-based systems uh, very easily. I did want to point out that seaweeds, by their virtue of growing, require carbon dioxide. So in areas where you have intense cultivation of seaweeds in open water conditions, even on land, uh, the waters will have increased levels of pH. This is important today because we are facing uh, our coastal oceans as having uh, lower pHs and the problems of ocean acidification have been discussed in many different venues, but seaweed aquaculture not only extracts nutrients, but also extracts carbon dioxide from the water and elevates the pH. So here you can see this whole system of the seaweeds there uh, being produced and these uh, tanks on the top there those are the finfish tanks, and we have ponds that are growing the seaweed, the growing the grassalaria in this particular case. So, what are the benefits of IMTA? The benefits, environmental sustainability. You're bioremediating the waters. You're having a product diversification. You're also increase, increasing economic sustainability for your farm systems. And we've seen that time and time again, where IMTA has been practiced there, economic sustainability has been increased with IMTA. So IMTA, it's a balanced ecosystem approach where you're combining the aquaculture of finfish and our shrimp with the aquaculture of shellfish, seaweeds, and sea cucumbers, or marine worms. And IMTA is in a very uh, important approach of dealing with uh, the aquaculture of fed organisms like finfish. And in New England, where we are growing finfish in open water conditions, IMTA is an approach that should be encouraged to expand uh, the feasibility, economic sustainability of each of the different components of I IMTA being the finfish, the shellfish, or the seaweeds. Much of the work that has been done on IMTA, I must give a shout out. There are many different agencies. There are many different scientists that have been involved. Uh, a lead agency for the United States has been NOAA uh, for IMTA, along with USDA and also other agencies like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And so when we take a look at IMTA, IMTA has progressed a great deal from those early experiments of just growing finfish up in the coastal Maine to now include finfish, shellfish, uh, growing together in open water or on land-based systems. I hope you had an opportunity to enjoy and learn something about IMTA systems is something that you should consider when you are developing your seaweed aquaculture. Look at using the nutrients that are available because your seaweeds need nutrients to survive and they can provide a very important ecosystem service. Thank you.